Welcome to the new abnormal. Yes, you know, the pandemic, it did accelerate the shift to digital, but it's also created disorder in our world. I mean, every day it seems that companies are resetting their office reopening playbooks. They're rethinking policies on large gatherings and vaccination mandates. There's a, an acute labor shortage in many industries and we're seeing an inventory glut in certain goods like bleach and hand sanitizer. Airline schedules and pricing algorithms, they're all unsettled. Is inflation transitory? Is it a real threat to the economy? GDP forecasts or seesawing? In short, the world is out of whack and the need for fast access to quality, trusted and governed data has never been greater. Can coherent data strategies help solve these problems or will we have to wait for the world to reach some type of natural equilibrium? And how are companies like Google helping customers solve these problems in critical industries like financial services, retail, manufacturing and other sectors? And with me to share his perspectives on data is a longtime Cube alum, Bruno Aziza. He's the head of data analytics at Google. Bruno, my friend, great to see you again, welcome. Great to see you, thanks for having me, Dave. So you heard my little narrative up front. How do you see this crazy world of data today? I think you're right. I think there's a lot going on in the, in the world of data analytics today. I mean, certainly over the last 30 years, we've all tried to just make the life of people better and give them access uh, more readily to the information that they need. But certainly over the last year and a half, two years, we've seen an amazing acceleration in digital transformation. And what I think we're seeing is that even after three decades of investment in the data analytics world, you know, the, the opportunity is still really out wide and, and is still available for organizations to get value out of their data as looking at some of the latest research in the market. And, you know, only 32% of companies are actually able to say that they get tangible, valuable uh, insights out of their data. So after all these years, we still have a lot of opportunity ahead of us, of course, with democratization of, of access to data, but also the advent in machine learning and AI so that people can make better decisions faster than their competitors. So do you think that the pandemic has heightened that sort of awareness as they, they were sort of forced to pivot to digital that they're maybe not getting enough out of their digital, their data strategies, that maybe their, whatever, their organization, their technology, their, their way they were thinking about data was not adequate and, and didn't allow them to be agile enough. Why do you think that only 32% are getting that type of value? I think it's true. I think one digital transformation has been accelerated over the last two years. I think, you know, if you look at research in the last two years, I've seen almost a decade of digital acceleration, you know, happening. But I also think that we're hitting a particular time where employees are expecting more from their uh, employers in terms of the type of insights they can get. Uh, consumers are now evolving, right? So they want more information. And I think now technology has evolved to a point where it's a lot easier to provision a data cloud environment so you can get more data uh, out to your constituents. So I think the, the connection of these three things, expectation of employees, expectation of customers to better customer experiences, and of course the global uh, you know, environment has accelerated uh, quite a bit uh, you know, where the space can go. And for people like me, you know, 20 years ago, nobody really cared about databases and, and so forth. And now I feel like, you know, everybody, uh, you know, understands the value that we can get out of it. And we're kind of getting, you know, uh, in, in the sexy territory, finally data now is sexy for everyone. And there's a lot of interest in the space. You and I met, of course, in the early days of Hadoop. Uh, and it was, yeah. there were many things about Hadoop that were profound. And of course, many things that, you know, just were overly complex, et cetera. But, but, but are, and one of the things we saw was this sort of the centralization. We thought that the Hadoop was going to send five megabytes of code to petabytes of data. And what happened is everything, you know, came into the centralized repository and that centralized thinking, the data pe pipeline organization was very centralized. Are you seeing companies rethink that? I mean, has the cloud changed their thinking? You know, especially as the cloud expands to the edge on-prem everywhere, how, how are you seeing organizations rethink the way they, their regimes for data? Yeah, I think, you know, we've seen over the last three decades, kind of a pendulum, right? From really centralizing everything and making the IT organization kind of the center of, of excellence for data analytics, all the way to now, you know, providing data as a self-service 
a, you know, application for end users. And I think what we're seeing now is there's a few forces happening. The first one is, of course, multi-cloud, right? So the world today is clearly multi-cloud and it's going to be multi-cloud for many, many years. So I think not only are now people considering their on-prem information, but they're also looking at data across multiple clouds. And so I think that is a huge force for chief data officers to consider is that, you know, you're not going to have data centralized in one place, nicely organized, because sometimes it's going to be a factor of where you want to be as an organization. Maybe you're going to be partnering with other organizations that have data in other clouds. And so you want to have an architecture that is modern and that accommodates this idea of an open cloud. The second problem that we see is this idea around data governance, intelligent data governance, right? So the world of managing data is becoming more complex uh, because of course you're now dealing with many different speeds, you're dealing with many different types of data. And so you wanna be able to empower people to get access to the information without necessarily having to move this data so they can make quick uh, you know, decisions on the data. So this idea of a data fabric is becoming really important. And then the third trend that we see, of course, is this idea around data sharing, right? People are now looking to use their own data to create a data economy around their business. And so the ability to augment their existing data with external data and create data products around it is becoming more and more important to the chief data officer. So it's really interesting. We're, we're seeing a switch from you know, the chief data officer really only worried about governance to this world now worried about innovation while making sure that uh, security and governance is taken care of. You know, we call this freedom within the framework, uh, which is which is a great challenge, but a great opportunity for many of these uh, data leaders. You mentioned several things there, self-service, multi-cloud, the governance key, especially if we can federate that governance in a decentralized world. Data fabric is interesting. Yeah. I was talking to Jamak Dagani this weekend on email. She's the, of course, the, uh, the she coined the term data mesh. And there seems to be yeah. some confusion, data mesh, data fabric, I think Gartner's using the term fabric. I know like NetApp, I think coined that term, which to me is like an infrastructure layer, you know, uh, 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 but, but what do you mean by data fabric? Well, the first thing that I would say is that it's not up to the vendors to define what it is. It really is up to, to the customer. The problem that we're seeing these customers trying to fix is you have a diversity of, of data, right? So you have data stored in the data mart, in a data lake, in a data warehouse, and they all have their specific, you know, reasons for being there. And so this idea of a data fabric is that without moving the data, can you one, govern it intelligently? And two, can you provide landing zones for people to actually do their work without having to go through the pain of setting up new infrastructure, moving information left and right and creating new applications. So it's this idea of basically taking advantage of your existing environment, but also governing it centrally, and also now providing self-service capabilities so people can do their job easily. So, you know, you might call it data mesh, you might call it a data fabric, you know, the terminology to me, uh, you know, doesn't seem to be the barrier. The issue today is how do we enable, you know, this freedom for customers? Because, you know, I think what I've seen with vendors out there is they try to just take the customer down to their paradigm. So if they believe in, all the answers need to be in the data warehouse. They're going to guide the customer there. If they believe that, you know, everything needs to be in a data lake, they're going to guide the customer there. What we believe in is this idea of choice. You should be able to do every single use case and we should be able to enable you to manage it intelligently, both from an access standpoint, as well as a governance standpoint. So when you think about those different, and I, I, I like that, you're making it somewhat technology agnostic. Uh, it, it, so if it's, whether it's a data warehouse or a data lake or a data hub, whatever you want to call data mart, those are nodes within the mesh or the fabric, right? That are discoverable, accessible, I guess governed. There's got to be some kind of centralized governance edict, but in a federated governance model, so you don't have to move the data around. Is that how you're thinking about it? Absolutely. You know, in our recent event in the Data Cloud Summit, uh, we had uh, Equifax. So the, the gentleman there was the VP of Data Governance and Data Fabric. So you can start seeing now these roles you know, created around this problem. And really when you listen to what they're trying to do, they're trying to provide as much value as they can without changing the habits of their users. I think that's what's key here is that the minute you start changing habits, force people into paradigms that maybe, you know, 
are useful for you as a vendor, but they're not so useful as uh, to the customer, you get into the danger zone. So the idea here is how can you provide a broad enough platform, a platform that is deep enough so the data can be intelligently managed and also distributed and activated at the point of interaction for the end user so they can do their job a lot easier. And that's really what we're about is how do you make data simpler? How do you make you know the, the process of getting to insight a lot more fluid uh, without changing habits necessarily, both on the IT side and the business side. I, I want to get to specifics on what Google is doing, but the last kind of Uber trends I want to ask you about, because again, we've known each other for a long time. We've seen this yeah. data world grow up and you're right, 20, 30 years ago, nobody cared about database. Well, maybe 30 years ago, but, yeah. but 20 years ago it was a boring market. Right now it's like the hottest thing going. But we saw, you know, bromide like, Data is the new oil. Well, we found out what well, actually data is more valuable than oil because you can use you know, data in a lot of different places. The oil you can use once. And then the term like data is an asset and you, you said data sharing. And it brings up the notion that you, know, you don't want to share your assets, but you do want to share your data as long as it can be governed. So we're starting to change the language that we use to describe data and our thinking is changing. And so it says to me that the next 10 years aren't going to be like the last 10 years. What, what are your thoughts on that? I think you're absolutely right. I think if you look at how companies are maturing their use of data, obviously the first bear is how do I as a company make sure that I take advantage of my data as an asset? How do I turn you know, all this information into a sustainable competitive advantage? You realize top of mind for organizations. The second piece around it is how do I create now this innovation flywheel so that I can create value uh, for my customers, my employees and my partners? And then finally, how do I use data as the center of a product that I can then further monetize and create further value into my ecosystem? I think that the piece that's been happening that people have not talked a lot about, I think, with the cloud, what's come is it's given us the opportunity to think about data as an ecosystem. Now you and I are partnering on insights. You and I are creating assets that might be the combination of your data, my data, Maybe it's an intelligent application on top of that data that now has become an intelligent, rich experience, if you will, that we can either both monetize or that we can drive value from. And so I think, you know, it's just scratching the surface on that, but I think that's where the next 10 years to your point are going to be is that the companies that win with data are going to create products, intelligent products out of that data. And they're just going to take us to places that we, you know, we are not even thinking about right now. Yeah, and I think you're right on. That is going to be one of the big differences in the coming years is data as product. And, and that brings up sort of the line of business, right? I mean, the line of, lines of business heads historically have been kind of removed from the data group. That's why I was asking you about the organization uh, uh, before, but let's get it to Google. What's, how do you describe Google's strategy, its approach and why it's unique? You know, I think one of the reasons, so I just, you know, started about a, a year ago. And one of the reasons for why I, I found, you know, the, the Google mission interesting is that it's really rooted at who we are and what we do. If you think about it, we make data simple. That's really what we're about. And we live that value. If you go to google.com today, what's happening, right? As an end user, you don't need any training. You're going to type in whatever it is that you're looking for. And then we're going to return to you highly personalized, highly actionable insights uh, to you as, as a consumer, as, as, a, as a consumer of insights, if you will. And I think that's where the market is going to. Now, you know, making data simple doesn't mean that you have to have simple infrastructure. In fact, you need to be able to handle sophistication at scale. And so simply our differentiation here is how do we go from highly sophisticated world of the internet, disconnected data, changing all the time, vast volume, and a lot of different types of data to a simple answer that's actionable to the end user, it's intelligence. And so our differentiations around that, our mission is to make data simple and we use intelligence to take the sophistication and provide to you an answer that's highly actionable, highly relevant, highly personalized so you, for you so you can go on and do your job because ultimately majority of people are not in the data business. And so they need to get the information just like you said as a business user that's relevant, actionable, timely so they can go off and you know, create value for their organization. So I don't think anybody would argue, I mean, Google obviously are data experts, you know, arguably the best in the world. Um, you, but it's interesting, some of the uniqueness here that I'm hearing in your language. You use the word multi-cloud, Amazon doesn't, you know, use that term. So that's a, that's a differentiation. Um, you sell, but you sell a cloud, right? You sell cloud services, but you're talking about multi-cloud. Um, 
Yeah. You, you sell databases, but of course you host other databases like Snowflake. So where, where do you fit in all this? Is your, do you see your role as the head of data analytics is to sort of be the chef that helps combine all these different uh, capabilities or are you sort of trying to help people adopt Google products and services? How should we think about that? Yeah, the best way to think about, you know, I spend 60 to 70% of my time with customers and the best way I could think about our role is to be your innovation partner uh, as an organization. And, you know, uh, you know, whichever is the scenario that you're going to be using, I think you talked about open cloud. I think another uniqueness of Google is that we're, we have a very partner friendly you know, approach to the business because we realize that when you walk into an enterprise or a digital native and so forth, they already have a lot of assets that they have accumulated over the years. And it might be technology assets, but also might be no knowledge and know-how, right? So we want to be able to be the innovation vendor that enables you to take these assets, put them together and create simplicity towards the data. You know, ultimately you can have all types of complexity in the back end, but what we can do the best for you is make that really simple, really integrated, really unified. So you as a business user, you don't have to worry about where is my data? Do I need to think about moving data from here to there? Are there things that I can do only if the data is formatted that way and this way. We want to remove all that complexity just like we do it on google.com so you can do your job. And so that's our job. And that's the reason for why people come to us is because they see that we can be their best innovation partner regardless where the data is and regardless you know, what part of the stack they're using. Well, I want, to, I want to take an example because my example, I mean, I don't know yeah. Google's portfolio like you do obviously, but one of the things I hear from customers is we're trying to inject as much machine intelligence in, into our data as possible. We see opportunities to automate. So I look at something like BigQuery, which yeah. has a strong affinity and embedded machine learning and, and machine intelligence as an example, maybe of that simplification, but maybe you could pick up on that and give us some other concrete examples. Yeah, specifically on products. I mean, there, there are a lot of products we can talk about and certainly BigQuery has tremendous market momentum, you know, and it's really anchored on this idea that, you know, the idea behind BigQuery is that just add data and we'll do the rest, right? So that's kind of the idea where you could start small and you can scale at incredible, uh, you know, volumes without really having to think about tuning it, about creating indexes and so forth. Also, we think about BigQuery as the place that people start in order to build their ecosystem. That's why we've invested a lot in machine learning. Just a few years ago, we introduced this functionality called a BigQuery machine learning or BQML, if you're familiar with it. And you notice out of the top 100 customers we have, 80% of these customers are using machine learning right out of um, you know, BigQuery. So now why is that? Why is it that it's so easy to use machine learning using BigQuery? It's because it's built in. It was built from the ground up. Instead of thinking about machine learning as an afterthought or maybe something that only data scientists have access to that you're going to license just for narrow scenarios, we think about you have your data in a, in a, in a warehouse that can scale that is equally awesome at small volume as very large volume. And we build on top of that, you know, similarly, we just announced our analytics uh, exchange, which is basically the place where you can now build these uh, data analytics assets that we discussed. So you can now build an ecosystem that creates value for end users. And so BigQuery is really at the center of a lot of that strategy, but it's not unlike any of the other products that we have. We want to make it simple for people to onboard, simple uh, to uh, scale, to really accomplish you know, whatever success is ahead of them. Well, I think ecosystems is another one of those big differences in the coming decade because you're, good, you're, you're able to build ecosystems around, around data, if, especially if you can share that data you know, and, and do so in a governed and secure way. But it leads to my question on industries. And I'm wondering if you see any patterns emerging in industries and each industry seems to have its own unique disruption scenario. You know, retail obviously has been you know, disrupted with online commerce and healthcare with of course the pandemic, financial services, you wonder, okay, are they a traditional bank's going to lose control of payment systems? Ma manufacturing, you see the, our reliance on, on China supply chain in, in, in of course North America. How, are you seeing any patterns in industry as it pertains to data? And what can you share with us in terms of insights there? Yeah, we, we are. And I mean, you know, there's obviously the industries that are, you know, very data savvy or data hungry. You think about 
you know, the telecommunication industry, uh, you think about manufacturing, uh, you think about financial services and retailers. I mean, financial services and retailers are particularly interesting because they're kind of both in, in the retail business and having to deal with this level of complexity of they have physical uh, locations and they also have a relationship uh, with people online. So they really want to be able to bring these two worlds together. You know, I think, you know, uh, about the scenarios of Carrefour, for instance, it's a large uh, retailer in Europe that has been able to not only to you know, uh, on board on our platform and they're using, you know, everything from BigQuery all the way to Looker, but also now create the data assets that enable them to differentiate uh, within their own industry. And so we see a lot of that happening across pretty much all industries. It's difficult to think about an industry that is not really taking a hard look at their data strategy recently, especially over the last two years, and really thought about how they're creating innovation. We have actually created what we call design patterns, which are basically blueprints for organization to take on. It's free, it's free guidance, it's free uh, data sets and, and code that can accelerate uh, their building of these innovative solutions. So think about uh, the you know ability to determine propensity uh, to purchase or build you know big a big trend is uh, recommendation systems. Uh, another one is anomaly detection, and this was great because anomaly detection is a scenario that works in telco but also in financial services. So we certainly are seeing now companies moving up in their level of maturity because we're making it easier and simpler for them to assemble these technologies and create you know, what we call data rich uh, experiences. I want to ask you the last question is, is how you see the emerging edge, IOT analytics in that space. You know, a lot of the machine learning or, or AI today is, is modeling in the cloud, as you well know. Uh, but, but when you think about a lot of the consumer applications, uh, whether it's voice recognition, you know, or fingerprinting, et cetera, um, you're seeing some really interesting you know, use cases that could bleed into the enterprise. And we think about AI inferencing at the edge as really driving a lot of value. How do you see that playing out and what's Google's role there? So there's a lot going on in that, in that space. I'll, I'll give you just a simple example. Maybe something that's easy for the community to understand is there's still ways that we you know, define certain metrics that are not taking into account what actually is happening in reality. I was just talking to a company whose job is to uh, deliver meals uh, to people. And what they have realized is that in order for them to predict exactly the time it's going to take them from the kitchen to your desk, they have to take into account the fact that distance sometimes it's not just horizontal, it's also vertical. So if you're distributing and you're delivering meals, uh, you know, in Singapore, for instance, high density, you have to understand maybe the data coming from the elevators. Uh, so you can determine, oh, if you're on the 20th floor, now my distance to you and my ability to forecast exactly when you're going to get that meal is going to be different than if you are on the fifth floor. And particularly if you're ordering at 1132 versus if you're ordering at 1158. And so what's happening here is that as people are developing these intelligent systems, they're now starting to input a lot of information that historically we might not have thought about, but that actually is very relevant to the end user. And so, you know, how do you do that? Again, and you have to have a platform that enables you to have a large diversity of use cases and that thinks ahead, if you will, of the problems you might run into. Lots and lots of innovation in this space. I mean, we we work with you know, companies like Ford to, you know, reinvent the, the connected, uh, you know, uh, cars. Uh, we work with companies like Vodafone 700 use cases to think about how they're going to deal with what they call their data ocean. You know, I thought you would like this term because we've gone from data lakes to data oceans. And so there is certainly a ton of innovation in, and certainly, uh, you know, the chief data officers that I have the opportunity to work with are really not short of ideas. I think what's been happening up until now, they haven't had this kind of single unified, simple experience that they can use in order to onboard quickly and then enable their people to build great, rich data applications. Yeah, we certainly had fun with that over the years, data lake or data ocean. And thank you for remembering that, Bruno. Always a pleasure seeing you. Thanks so much for your time and, and sharing your perspectives and, and informing us about what Google's up to. Can't, can't wait to have you back. Thanks for having me, Dave. All right, and thank you for watching everybody. This is Dave Vellante. Appreciate you watching this CUBE conversation. We'll see you next time.